Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the High Vibration Living Podcast. I'm your host, Chef Whitney Aronoff, and today I am with two fellow chefs, Colin and Cody of Fish Restaurant in Los Angeles. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Chef. Thank Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll wind you guys back up to where we just were chatting about fish, like I mentioned <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> You guys, you guys are really experts. You guys don't just have a fish restaurant, but you, you guys are chefs. You love cooking. You love the ocean. Um, you have a deep connection to surfing in the ocean. And obviously if you're going to eat or prepare food, you want to cook with the best quality ingredients for yourself and for your clientele. Um, and so what I want to learn today is how to be a better consumer. And I want to learn how to better choose fish for myself and for my clients. So let's just get into it and we'll let it flow where it flows. So okay. where should we- I'll like, let like Cody thing? take it first, yeah. Okay. You want me to take it first? Yeah, you take okay. it, take it first and then I'm gonna jump in and interrupt okay. you when I feel necessary. All right, <laughs> so when you, like, I'll ask you a question. When you go to a restaurant, like um, what are you selecting as, as just a, a person that just what's your fish go to fish of choice? I don't have a fish I prefer. I want okay. I want the best quality fish that they have back there. I don't want them pulling okay. out a fillet, defrosting it, and pan searing it in canola Perfect. oil and serving to me. I okay. am open minded. Okay. I want okay. something that is is real. Um, <laughs> quality, right. right. No, um, it doesn't have to be a name brand fish. I think there's more fish in the sea than okay. we'll ever know. So okay. I'm probably a little bit different. I don't care if okay. there's bones. I don't care if there's skin. You know. <laughs> right. Okay. So you're the, you're in the yeah. You're not in the pedestrian thing. Well, I would say this: depending on the person and what they want to eat, like what they want to prepare that that evening. Um, one, think about where it's coming from like that, that particular fish, think about what, what season it is. Think about if it's gonna be fresher or frozen. And that's your first question of how you wanna have that fish. Um, as far as like for the, the normal consumer, just in America, depending on where you live, that's really, you have the, you got that luck. But if you're in the middle of, of America, it's really tough because there's just by default, not the best options as it is as it is as beef and produce. So it's your, the, the odds against you are already kind of stacked. That's, that's the hard part for fish game. Um, it's gonna be probably frozen and you probably want it frozen mm -hmm. because most places like the butcher, the fishmonger, that's kind of been, those don't really exist anymore mm -hmm. um, like your, your meat butcher does. So that's, it's a really hard question for, for most people because there aren't really the best options. But I would say this, if someone's got the buying power that could buy a lot in mass quantities, they're, they're probably going to get something that's well, relatively decent and accessible to, to taste like fish and not be some, like what you're saying, like fake fish. It's really tough. That, that, and that is the question that's already hard for people to get right now. Like I was, we were talking about earlier, fish is still the wild west. It's just been in its own little world. Whereas beef and produce are just so much more on the forefront. Um, and there's more money in it for the retailer. That's, that's the bottom line. It's really hard for retailers to make money with fish. Interesting. So do uh, the distributors of fish like, make more money selling to restaurants and to grocery fish stores? World. Can I hear? Hang on. You've got right audio. Right. What'd yeah. you say? I said there's Dude. two different worlds. You, you've, got, you, you've got restaurant consumption and you've mm -hmm. got personal use. And so for personal use too, there are several companies out there that can deliver sustainable packaging with sustainable fish. Cody can like tell you a couple of them. You know, the packaging's beautiful, it's fully traceable, and as a home consumer, but it's wildly expensive. It's you would look really at the expensive. Yeah. and you'd be like, wow, I don't know if I wanna spend this much money, but you can get a box and get that delivered. Now, if you're dealing with a restaurant, they have a better distribution network, especially if you're buying a major city and stuff like that. You know, yeah, stuff that goes into yeah. Vegas or Denver is just as good as the stuff that's landing in the LA and stuff like that. So if you go to a reputable restaurant that you know is carrying quality fish, that has a great menu, that's probably not been frozen anywhere in the chain, 
and it's been prepared correctly, you're going to have most likely a really good experience with that. We're lucky now we're in an information age that you can dissect anything that's going on and, and, and find what's the end of the road, you know, I, I believe. What's also really cool too is a lot of menus now, especially like with ours, we're putting our sources on there. We like to be completely transparent. Yeah. And we're not trying to throw these words around too. And, and Cody will back me up on this. Sustainable is a word. It's just slapped <laughs> onto things nowadays. And it's ridiculous. That North American uh, Seafood Expo, I'm walking around and you know, there's like, sustain- I was on every single booth, Star Kiss Tuna. And I'm like, you guys are really claiming to you guys are like a yeah, mega corporation yeah. using trawler fleets, you know, like net bike kits. Like, what? come please, where's your rep? Let's talk. Why is this sustainable? <laughs> One more thing I wanted to add with this too, I think why fish isn't as popular, let's say in the middle of the country, just for America, um, is we have like fish trauma. And like you said, Whitney, uh, a person gets like, I think a tilapia and the chef took it and defrosted it and it sat in, in you know, fish water for two days and the fish, the chef takes it out and then cooks it and it tastes even fishier. It probably tastes even worse than it would have been, you know, any other way. People eat that as their first experience with fish and they're like, I don't want to ever do this again. I don't blame them. That's what I call Seriously. fish trauma. Yeah. And that's yeah. what the fish industry in America suffers from on a consumer standpoint where people can't change their opinions about that because they've been traumatized going, no, this tastes horrible. It tastes like something has been rotting underneath a rock. Cody and myself are embracing different philosophies with the fish, buying local sourced, buying from sustainable farms, dry aging the fish and clean it correctly. And then once it's broken down, we're taking our fillets, we're drying those fillets out even more. And that's the big tip I gave all these people that I talk to in town or clients and customers. I'm like, take your fillets out and put them between paper towels and change those paper towels if you want to keep it for a day or two. That dry, cold essence is yeah. the ultimate secret with fish, hands down. If you have a dry, cold product and then you prepare that and reintroduce it to heat and you know temperature, it's going to come out amazing. And that's what fish protein yeah. should be. It's something incredible like that. So explain to me, how do I do that? So I pull out my filet, I take a a plate, I put down paper towels, put the filet down, put down paper towels on top of that. And And I'm cheating that paper towel morning and night. And how many days should I leave it in the fridge? You honestly, I mean, we've done experiments that would blow your mind, but I mean, you, (laughs) if it is a, if it is a fresh fish for real, you can keep something on paper towels for five or six days. And I know, and I'm and, not telling and depending people on how you want it prepared to like, right. do you want to use that skin? Are you going to pan sear that skin and want it crunchy? Then you yes. definitely want as much moisture off that skin because you want that skin to dry out. You almost want to have it like that. You want it to get tacky around this, around all sides and kind of oxidize. Um, especially if it's like a pre-frozen fish, you want to get as mo- most moisture out of that fish as possible. So when it hits the pan, Frozen fish is really tough. The molecular structure of fish changes a lot once it's frozen. It's not the same product that it was before. Cody and I, I wouldn't say we're anti-frozen fish guys, but with with what we do with suits and stuff like that, we love fresh, prepared, dry, cold. And we know how to control that whole thing. It's its 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 own work of art, you know? And and I'll say this for consumers. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Real quick. I'll say this for consumers, there's many levels of, of how the actual fish is being frozen too. Like there's soup frozen stuff, that, you know, when it's frozen, it, it doesn't really get, the, the protein structure doesn't get as much like water molecules in the protein. So it's actually the best way if you're gonna get a frozen look for super frozen, it'll be a, it'll be a little bit more expensive, but the quality will be that much better. So that's something for, as a consumer, if, you, if you're gonna get frozen fish, Try to see if they if there's a version of it that's super frozen. It's probably the best bang for the buck if you actually want to taste that essence of that fish. Otherwise, it's just going to taste like water. So if I'm going to the grocery store, it doesn't ma- even matter. Like if I'm going to Whole Foods, does it even matter if I go over and look at the fresh fish since most, most of it's frozen defrosted? Or do I just go straight for the frozen? Or do I need to start going someplace else? It, it, that, that depends. You need to start going somewhere else. I hate saying that, but I well, mean, well, well, but, 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 but one, listen, but, but Whole Foods carries Oracle. Whole Foods carries Oracle. True. And, and that, that's true. like, 
probably the top of the level of salmon. We can segue into the salmon conversation next if you want. But, you know, if you look at the sourcing for Whole Foods and you look itemized down, they have a lot of incredible products. They're very traceable as well. They, they are starting yeah. to open up that conversation for the future. We are spoiled because we live by the coast. And if I wanted to go down to Catalina Offshore yeah. and go to their market right now, I can get the world's bounty. If I want to go to Santa Monica Seafoods and go into their retail markets, we're just, we're lucky. We have amazing produce in California. We have yeah, amazing really fish. Lucky. We we have a chef's paradise here. Yeah. So for this conversation saying somebody from Texas or Oklahoma or Kansas, it's a whole other world. And they don't have the exposure, even the palate to like maybe want those kind of seafoods. That's changing them. And as we go True. forward and we look at health too, Whitney, like we were talking about earlier, fish is going to become a huge part of American diets, whether they like it or not. People are having all these health issues and fish is a really good segue to have clean proteins. And the companies that Cody and I work with, yeah. such as Pacific yeah. Aquacultures or uh, Omega Azul, they have some of the most incredible uh, protein raised you can even possibly buy. So that leads us to something we've been chatting about is when people get that news from their doctor or they're finally made the decision that they want to eat more healthy or health supportive, they start to look at fish and they think, I need to eat salmon. That's the first fish they think they, they have to start eating, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's popular. It's the rock star. It's, it's, the kids love it. The kids love Whitney. It's a Which thing. Which is so funny because there was a time where it was the cheapest fish and it was sure. the least popular. Well, so um, was yeah. lobster. Lobster was fed in the prisons before it became in. I know. Crazy though. Abalone was on the menu Abalone at the too. at San Diego State University when my dad was in college. <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. Spoiled right there. I love that. Can you believe? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so this, the salmon conversation is um is a really interesting one. There's some really good salmon and there's some really bad salmon. And then I mean there's almost three elements. You have good salmon, you have bad salmon, and then you have your wild salmons. Um I'll let Cody kind of take over the mm. bad stuff right now I, and i guess that kind of goes <laughs> okay well, well i guess that kind of goes into the scottish farms yeah i like to t i like to talk about the, the two farms that we love using or the three you know like there's only a handful that we really really trust that do quality product um and we were talking too about that thing that costco just came out where there's worms crawling around in their salmon at costco and Tony, i was telling whitney about the north american seafood expo when the costco reps are coming through the booth like if you sell salmon to costco that's paid it like you you're oh man like you're... oh yeah because again <laughs> costco's got that buying power um but with salmon so so when you like so salmon's a very easy fish to farm they're very resilient they'll eat anything they're and and two their their growth rate's great they're just a really smart fish to grow as a protein yeah. um just like there's really good beef farms and there's good tomato farms and strawberry farms there's really bad farms and if you're in the commodity business where it's more about selling and making a bottom line and making a lot of money for little overhead, salmon's your way to go. Tilapia is good. There's more money in salmon or else everyone would be growing tilapia, right? Tilapia bigger, just doesn't bigger have that yield, thing. Bigger yield with right, salmon. Bigger, bigger yield, bigger, oh, bigger rewards. Fish. And, bigger fish. and it's, just, it's just a staple on menu. So why not get in the salmon game? You can raise that stuff anywhere. So the good farms, uh, really good control as far as their kill methods, as far as the environmental methods, as far as the feed, and as far as just overall general health of, of um, they're making Ferraris of the sea. You know, they're putting the best stuff into it. They're more about the quality versus quantity. And then there's the exact opposite where they're just, the pen densities, they're living on top of each other. There's heavy antibiotics. Um, you know, there's terrestrial proteins. They're eating like a pellet with like chicken feed and they're mm -hmm. taking waste from chicken farms and they're turning it into like a, a meal and they're just feeding the shit out of those. They're putting coloring in it to get the, the color back because the way that thing would come out looking standard wise would be a really like not the best, I'm looking for one right now, but uh, something that's just not visually that great. So there's, you know, there's tricks to be done to, to get it to where you're selling it all over the world and, and you're getting, you know, it, that's a, a business that it doesn't, to me, ethically, it doesn't make sense, but I could see why people would do it. It's you're also, raising protein, just not the best Cody, quality protein. Cody too. Also, um, this is a good thing for you to like embellish on. 
when you're talking about sustainable fish farming, the genetics of the fish are really important. And when you look at yeah. salmon farms, they have a almost bastardized genetics system where it's heavily, heavily inbred. And so you have yeah. these salmons that are not, you know, completely like perfect fish. And to segue that back into like uh, Omega or Pacifico, they have a really strong genetics program that's changing it up a lot and they're breeding healthy fish. That's the most important part about doing fish farming is having a powerful genetics program that's not inbred. And so these really bad salmon farms, they're heavily, heavily inbred. And then if you have like pen escapes like they do up in uh, Washington or Oregon, or, or Canada, sudden, well, that was or Canada. Big. okay, huge. I'm just saying you have hundreds of thousands of inbred kind of retarded fish running around the ocean, spawning and mating with the wild fish, and it's destroying the wild genetics. That's crazy. That's crazy, yeah. crazy. Imagine a bunch of cows escaping and mating with buffalo, and all of a sudden you have this like buffalo cow running that's around just, the plains. You know, in a term like that's just, it's shortcut industry. Yeah. They're just taking shortcuts to get the best, you know, the best payday and and that's unfortunately that's what ends up on most menus i think when they're they're going they're talking to salmon because they're not like as a buyer either you're, you're buying for like a hotel you're buying for a hospital or a large thing bottom line is money right what's that protein cost to put on that plate and if it's going to be a fish let's try to get something that one people are going to eat it if we're going to buy we want to make sure it gets off you know gets used so salmon is the the way to go it's the gateway fish for a lot of people it's, it's accessible to people so salmon's a big industry and there's farms unfortunately that come and go um the ones that are stick around that have the the higher name they are tending to use a better quality feed and do all those be you know best farming practices one that'll get them on menus because a lot of these uh, the high end hotels have like a program where you have to be kind of vetted you have to be like asc certified or msc certified or uh, you just have to have some kind of certification and then that chain or group will buy from those like you know those those farms that are doing it that way so there that's the upper tier unfortunately most of of just the industrial ways is i mean the 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 normal average day it's commodity based salmon farms so and that's so, that's the fact what are the farms i should be buying from and so if I I yeah. have to buy from a farm, what are and who are the ones? So to look here, for? here's just a couple of our favorites. And this is also, you know, this is it, it goes into geography almost in a funny way. If you look at like the, the premier salmon farm, in my opinion, Cody's been, we just absolutely love Aura King salmon. This comes from the Marlboro Sounds in the North Island, uh, South Island of New Zealand. It's the very northern part of the South Island. If you've ever been to New Zealand and seen it, it's undescribably beautiful. It looks like a Norwegian Ford, but it's in New Zealand. The water temperature is really cold. The, in their brochures, you can go online. This is what we tell all of our clients that are eating our sushi and stuff. We're like, look, we don't care if you believe us or not. Like we're trying to be transparent. Go online, do the Pepsi challenge, read up to what these people are doing and decide for yourself. Like that you're the, you're the end of the line. You vote with your dollars. So if you look at the Marlboro Sounds and you look that this salmon has been raised in some of the cleanest water in the earth right now, it's been raised from an embryo, transferred from pens out in the ocean, done its life cycle, and then re-brought back in. I mean, it's an incredible process. Yeah. The Aura yeah. the Aura King the Aura King salmon, once you actually start working with it, it's very hard to work with because it's very soft and be very brittle. But the really color, fatty. Really, the color, really fatty. The, the color and texture of the salmon, it, there is nothing like it. It is so clean, so beautiful. It is absolutely incredible. I mean, raw cooked whatever you want from it it's amazing we love using um icelandic salmon as well there's two farms that we've been using um from iceland uh, that were producing amazing salmon um and there's a there's a handful of other ones that are also starting to do that there um norway is another really good place the, norway can be hit and miss though because cody kind of saying some of them are larger commodity farms but mm -hmm. yeah they've been around mm -hmm. they've been they've been in the game yeah. for a long time they kind of wrote yes. the book Yes, no on, way on did like the book. Um, the, there's ones the that are, yeah, there's some ones that are, are, are holdouts that are doing really good practices. And there's some ones that are like, yeah, we, we can make a little money on this. So let's go this way over here. Just make some. The, the make funny thing fun. about the funny thing about Norway too, and it's sustainable fishing practices. is like 
I want to say like 45% of the entire population of Norway works in the fishing industry in s sustainable fish farming, more or less. Those guys are such experts in it that they're shopping their talents out to other farms around the world to grow different fish products around the world because they know that I was, we were talking with the CEO of Pacifico, I was completely blown away. And Pacifico has, I think two or three different Norwegian fish experts that they hired Pacifico is in Toto Santos, you know, and yeah. you're like, and I'm going down the rabbit hole. Then I'm like, wait a minute, wait. Uh, yeah, when you get out of high school, you know, you most likely need to work for the oil. Yeah, yeah, that's like way left. Shit, did I lose you guys? I thought that was the craziest thing in the world is um, how big of an impact fish farming has in, in Norway. It's a career choice you make to like improve your life. And all of a sudden, these guys are all over the world kind of using their knowledge to help. Um, build other companies up right now it's, it's it's pretty incredible so for those those are our, our, our key points we love iceland we love norway we love new zealand um the wild salmon it's hard with wild fish a lot of the times to make sure that the cold chain has been kept correctly or the fish has been processed the right way because with the wild there's a lot of variables that, that are kind of hard to figure out a little bit with with sustainable fish farms that have all the certifications that cody was saying you have them cataloged, you have them serial numbered, they have temperatures taken when they've been processed or not. All of those things are traceable and they're really important for us. We had an issue with a product, we could call the company and be like, this was a serial number, what was wrong with it, blah, 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 and they'll get back to you about that. With the wild stuff, it's up in the air. You know what I mean? It, it, it's undiscernible sometimes. Um, so, and well, the other thing is wild. with... Yeah, there's no, with you the, know, and with with the wild salmon now too is like there's the heavily inbreeding with them, with a lot of these like pen releases and stuff like that. Years ago, there was like radioactive isotopes that people were worried about that the fish were ingesting from Fukushima. You know what I mean? There's, you know, uh, agricultural runoff and stuff, and it just goes on and on and on. As we're moving forward in the fish future, it's becoming sustainable because it's more controllable. So, with the farmed fish they're getting to test the water and make sure that these fish are actually living, breathing, functioning in cleaner water than sadly what's out there in river streams right now. Crazy. Is that correct? Yeah, it's way, yeah, it's way, it's way more regulated. I mean, they, they have to, by definition, they, have to. they want yeah. to protect their, you know, their, their, that's a big, it's, I mean, farmed fish, farming fish is really expensive. Like, it's, it's, it's a dumb thing to go into. I don't even know why people want to farm fish because it's so expensive. There's so many variables. You're working with and against Mother Nature at the same time. So many things can go wrong and nothing you can even plan for. So, you know, I understand when people want to take shortcuts, but there's, you know, there's farms that want to do the right thing. And so they're taking the water samples all the time. They're, they've got a, like, I'll say a veterinarian, a vet on on site that's always checking the quality, you know, always checking the, the, the genetics, you know, they're always looking at feed, you know, alternatives, something that's more sustainable, something that's more seaweed based now. Um, you know, they're, that's where the industry is going. And again, I don't even know, we, 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 we should always start this calling is, um, we are not like anti wild fish. We love wild fish, but there's less control in wild fish. And it's a lot of money that you're spending and you, you don't have any guarantees with wild fish. Whereas mm -hmm. farm fish, if you really, you know, learn that farm and, and like the practices, that farm pretty much will get you, you know, your fish on time, right? Whenever you want it, year round, if the, if the farm is really good, um, a consistent size and a consistent price. And as chefs, that's so much easier, so much easier to make a, a menu and have that menu to be able to serve with no like, dude, there's no halibut tonight. So sorry. We thought we'd have some. We didn't get it. And you're like, oh, shit. It's Friday night and I've got, you know, you know I'm going to do 200 covers. And I've got, I've got none of that special that we ran last night. And, we, you know, all the servers are ready. To, then we don't have it. That's the hard part of working with wild fish. I mean. More importantly, too, Cody. Would I still do it? Of course. But more importantly, too, as Go we ahead. were starting to find out moving into like a new climate change future, albacore and tuna yeah, were two yeah. things that were, I mean, we can't say we're not phasing them out because they're really important parts, but mm -hmm. storms. No, remember January. 
Yes, like for a month straight, they were like, "No one's fishing. Oh, yeah. the, the seas are fifty yeah, foot. We These guys are not going out." Hard in and all of a sudden, you're like, "Okay, well, it, we can't get it out of the ocean. We can't have it." But we were getting our farm yeah. fish because it's in pens. They're in like different areas that are slightly sheltered. Cody and I always say too that we're embracing the future of fish with trying to make sustainable fish farms our flagship. We're giving wild fish a break as well. But we're also really receptive to using as much wild stuff as we can get because it's a big part. We love supporting local fishermen. We love supporting that industry. And there's nothing better than being able to use the bounty that's right in front of you here. That is probably talk, the most important part. And talking part about it, you know, having the conversation would be cool with the customer. A customers. sustainability profile is like, yeah, this came 50 miles out front. You know what I mean? The tuna was bled perfectly. Yeah. These guys are absolute experts. It was iced. And like, this is the bounty of the ocean we have. San Diego is so lucky here. We have a plentiful supply of bluefin tuna that's wild that we can constantly pull from that we manage really well with the stocks. That's incredible. There's very few places in the world that you can still pull out bluefin tuna right now. And there's a plentiful stock. Everywhere else has been wildly overfished and shipped overseas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, we like a like, let's, but, but let's go back to like the hard part. Like we had a really hard January, Whitney. Mm -hmm. We just no, couldn't. And, 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 and when we were, um, Nothing at the grocery you know, when store. We were, right. <laughs> yeah. When we were talking about putting a menu together, the conversation like, okay, we know we're going to use these guys, these, this, these farms with this. And then, you know, Colin's like, dude, do we use tuna? And do we use, do you want to use this stuff out of Mexico? Do you want to use, you know, like, because at some point it's going to get hard. Tuna was always the hard, it's always the hard one for us. Still is. So, it's the most expensive still fish. Still is, four, yeah. It's always, there's four so many variables. Four times over, it's always the most parasitic of any of the fish you deal with. It's so funny that right. tuna has, is so in vogue, is so in fashionable, is like the premier fish. Anybody always ask, how's the tuna? Dude, it's $28 a pound. Like, <laughs> there's yeah. no money to be made. And then you get it. Then you go, you go pick it up and you, you know, you don't know until you cut into it. So we look at it, we're like, oh, it looks pretty good. And then you put it up, you know, take, you know, we were buying hundred pound tunas, throwing up on the thing. And then sometimes you cut into them. You're like, oh my God, this is, you know, everyone's stoked for, you know, doing the happy dance. Sometimes you open one up and you're like, oh man, this one sucks. Like we're, yeah, we like, can't even, you know, plenty of times. Okay. So What's that? tuna. What's that? Can you slice it open? Oh, go, go ahead, Colin. Yeah, go ahead. There's, Colin, Colin will take this one. Tuna is probably one of the most parasitic fishes that we deal with by and by. There's several different types of parasites that affect the tunas, but the sachi parasite is probably the number one. And once the fish is caught and goes into rigor mortis, inside the sachi parasite, it's like a almost like a big white ball that exists inside the flesh. When the fish goes into rigor mortis, this ball pops and it looks like it had been burned with like, literally like acid. It's like this gooey abscess that's been inside the fish now. You wanna make sure you cut that out and do not serve it to people. I can't imagine how many parasites people probably eat from tuna on a daily basis. It's inconceivable. Not to mention segueing into like the conversation of like industrialized pokey, you know, your poke bowls that are like $12.95, $15. This is kind of like the version of like fish hot dog in a weird way. These giant tunas are broken down. Yeah. They're, they're put into macerated blenders. It's repressed into like a chicken McNugget paste. And then it's repackaged and frozen. So like you're literally, it's like the equivalent of a chicken McNugget or a hot dog put back in the fish. The economics of pokey don't work at all. So it's really weird. Fresh tuna, $27 a pound right now, market price. Your tuna pokey, which is almost about quarter to half a pound of fish, is a frozen pressed product, pressed with carbon monoxide and dyed. So you're eating chemicals, you're eating carbon monoxide poisoning. But for fifteen dollars, you can have that with rice and two sides. Forget it. Like tuna's crazy, crazy. So like Cody's saying, we would buy tuna and we might have like a thirty percent loss with a tuna cutting it open and going, dude, look at all these sachi parasites. The water was warm. This was a sick fish. It's almost like a, a thing of numbers. You know, you take 10 fish and three or four of those fish will be sachi ridden. They'll have parasites in them. There's also yeah. tuna worms. I mean, like our XGM, uh, I would love to grow some out because guys like, look, look at this. And I'd be pulling out like a tuna worm and be like, but this, I mean, that's the thing. Tuna is so popular. People don't understand or know this. And it's really interesting to understand the history of why we eat tuna 
now it has a lot to do with World War II and post World War II Japan. We had all these American servicemen stationed in Japan post World War II, and they were starting to eat the normal foods of Japan, like sushi, but they didn't really care for the really fishy fishes and stuff like that. So an enterprising Japanese guy was like, well, you know, tuna tastes like a, a raw steak kind of, and it does have this like really rare steak kind of flavoring to it. And I, you know, they started serving it more and more to American servicemen, and that's where it kind of became in fashion. And now obviously tuna is like the premier fish of all fish. If you look at, you know, menus pre-World War II for Japan, this tuna wasn't as important as it is today. Now it's the number one fish. I mean, around the world, bluefin tuna of certain sizes go for millions of dollars. It's high fatty. It's just delicately beautiful, but it's got some issues and it's really expensive. They're literally pulling out dinosaurs for the world's consumption. And tuna is on every menu around the world. You're not dealing with small fishes that are easier to raise or easier to produce. And that's probably closer to the future. What Cody and I are trying to embrace is like, let's deal with striped bass. Let's deal with compaches. Let's go with smaller fish. They're easier to raise. They're easier to handle. It's less to ship. I mean, shipping a 250-pound tuna, it takes a lot of effort. You have to have forklifts. And it's a crazy process. And not only getting those things on the table and breaking them down, it's intense. Yeah, and I think people are slowly, maybe on the east and west coast, people that are coastal, Right. I think they consciously know, gosh, I probably need to start trying other types of fish. There's more out there. Absolutely. So what should we be looking for on a menu or what should we look online to purchase to get us out of eating salmon, tuna, halibut, and maybe well, for some of the fish? So, I mean, um, unfortunately for tuna health-wise, it's got a lot of mercury in it. Fish that grow that big have eaten a lot of fish to get to that size, and they're heavily laden with mercury. Mercury is very bad for you to have. So for me, halibut's actually a really good, clean choice. Unfortunately, there's good halibuts and bad halibuts. I love wild halibut. It's a really clean, easy, flaky fish. The problem with halibut taste-wise, though, because it's a bottom feeder, is it's going to taste like mud or sand in a weird way. It's got a really, like, distinct flavor to it. Um, I always say stay away from tilapia because commercial tilapia farms are just absolutely abhorrent. You know what I mean? They, they're raised under the worst possible circumstances. They're fed the, the worst kind of things. Look for striped bass. It's an emerging product right now. There's only, I think it's only just one company right now that's kind of putting them out. But like I said, we were talking earlier about the Cheesecake Factory was um, looking at trying to get them for an entree. And oh, yeah. Because it's the new part of it. Branzinos are also a, a good option they're raised in the Mediterranean. Um, there's a really good farm that does Branzinos really well. Um, and they have a bunch good. of, yeah, some of them are. I'm just saying she's asking for different options for like non-salmon, non-tuna fishes. Um, yeah. We were always saying the striped bass because it's closer to home for us. The Branzinos have to come from the Mediterranean. So you also mm -hmm. look at carbon footprint. And that's the tough part about salmon is New Zealand to here. That's a long ways. Norway, there's only certain places that these come from. So we want to limit the carbon footprint as much as possible. Uh, Kampachi is one of our favorite fish. That's like a, a yellow tilt and amberjack. Um, very like dense, firm, beautiful, high fat content, um, incredible fish. There's a handful of farms that are doing Kampachi really well as well. Our favorite is Omega Azul. That's located in La Paz. Cody and I are actually flying down on Monday or Tuesday and making food for uh, a bunch of Japanese reps that are coming in. Um, and it's kind of exciting. It's, it's two white boy sushi. Strike making, mission. Uh, yeah, making sushi for a bunch of Japanese guys is, is pretty cool. Um, cod fishes are also really good. I also love oh, those. God. But, you know, and, and that can be prepared in a lot of different ways. Um, it, regionally, too, fish tastes differ. You know, if you're in the South, you're big on catfish and stuff like stuff that comes out of the Gulf and stuff like that. I, snappers are always a beautiful, beautiful choice as well. I was going to ask. I tend to buy whole red snappers and to do the salt crust with them. And they turn out great every time. It's insane. Everything loves the flipper. It's insane. Alfonsinos are just amazing. Everything snapper is kind of the premier fish. But sourcing wise for those can be a little complicated as well. And a lot of the times you might have Japanese distributors. They don't uh, influence on sustainability, but their quality is always going to be really good. So one time I went, one time I went to Cuba, I was in Cuba for a week and there aren't many protein options 
it's not much not much option on the menu any place you eat in Cuba. Um, but there was always red snapper on the menu. Art. But every time I got served red snapper, it was a different color. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Every time I got served red snapper, it was a different color, different texture. God knows what they were serving me. Sometimes too, like in Mexico, they they have a snapper version, but they call it huachinango. And it's got like, it's black to red kind of scales. Genetically, a lot of the snappers vary a little bit, but like okay. those small white fish like that are just such a beautiful option. I love local rockfish around here too. They are okay. just amazing. On the menu. Oh, oh, that's yeah. a- a lot at Whole Foods in oh, Southern dude, California. Uh, that is such a great sustainable option. Sculpin, okay. also a great sustainable option. Just be careful if you're doing sculpin in any way, shape, or form that that back fin um, is either been clipped off or you wear gloves and then clip it off very carefully. It's poisonous. And um, what fish did I stab myself with last year? Two years ago. Last year. I ended up putting uh, my ring was, finger um, on... Um, they were snappers. Oh, I just can't remember where they came from. Um, and it hit me right here in my finger. And that same day, that was, I was prepping for the restaurant and then had to fly to Tahoe for a wedding we were doing. And I got on the plane and my hand was killing me. And all of a sudden, I don't know if it's the pressure of the plane, but my ring finger blew up like the size of a grape. And oh my God. The next morning, um, I had to go to the hospital and they had to do surgery on my finger and and drain the poison out. The doctor was like, dude, another 12 hours, we're going to cut your finger off. And I was like, okay, highly poisonous, uh, you know, dorsal things up there. So be really careful. Interesting. I had no idea that oh, if yeah. you get hurt by the fins of certain fish, it's actually you, poisonous. And more importantly, let's just say this one had really bad bacteria on it and it went straight into my skin as well um and i've stabbed myself a bunch of times and never had an issue like that but this one i'll never treat it the same way again um so that's just that's just one of those things like i said um sheep's head is also another really good fish that's local around here that you can find here or there um i love a good sheep's head that's that's it's a beautiful it's, it's got an ugly face to it. Um, bonitos are great. Mahi-mahis are also an amazing fish. I want to do mahi-mahi raw, but I, it, it, you know, it's great um, cooked. There's so many different ways. And mahi-mahi is another one of those fish that, like, if you can process it correctly and keep it dry, it'll turn into something beautiful. We have amazing local yellowtail here as well that's really popular that you can find a lot. Um, and that's a really accessible fish when they're wanting to bite and stuff like that. Corbina are, are fish you can catch off just in, off the coast here, you know, like shore oh, yeah. fishing and stuff like that. And those are great little eaters. So, so for those that want to eat sushi, they want to eat raw fish. What should they be looking for? What should they be ordering on the menu instead of the salmon and tuna? That's a larger question too of also talking about where you're going to eat your sushi. Now, I don't really believe sushi should be a cheap food. Um, we have people that want to be eating all you can eat, like cheap foods, and that just doesn't work, like especially with sushi. You got to have these skilled technicians that know what they're doing and know how to process it correctly. So if you're going for an all you can eat experience or something that's really cheap, you're going to be eating chemicals, you're going to be eating frozen fish, and you're gonna be kind of going into that industrial side of the fish world. And we're like vehemently against that. We're against trawling fleets. We're against these like giant corporations just robbing the oceans of its bounty, processing the food, whether you realize it or not, injecting it with chemicals and carbon monoxide, and then feeding it to you. That's the last thing you wanna do. Sushi needs to be simple, beautiful, and, and, and very delicious. So, price point has a lot to do with it, I would say. It, make sure that you're actually paying for something that's really good. The premier OG sushi fish were snappers, Thai snappers. And they've, that's been around as a staple forever. So I always stress snapper is one of the go-tos. Kompachi, absolutely 100% on any sushi menu, go for the kompachi. Most likely it's never been frozen. Hopefully it's come from one of these really good farms around the world. Which, well, there's, there's a couple, we can't hear you, Cody. There's a, there's a couple farms, actually. I know which one he's going to say. We're not going to name it out loud, though. But Kampachi is, is, a, is a good go-to. Um, striped bass, if you can find it on the menu, is amazing. If you go to, like, a really good omakase menu, um, 
those guys all have Japanese distributors. So there's two different philosophies. You've got Japanese distribution and you've got the non-Japanese distribution. Non-Japanese distribution, like what we're doing is really, really hard to find. We're yeah. working directly with the farms. We're getting that shipped into LA and we're picking it up and then processing it. So a lot wow. of the Japanese industries are using Japanese distributors that are flying it over from Japan. It's been, you know, at their farms or raised the way they wanted to do it. And it can be a mixed bag sometimes, but it's a beautiful experience. So I, I always like the white fishes. Albacore is also a really good one, but we were doing fresh albacore. And what you see most of the time is frozen albacore. Frozen albacore is like a, almost like a flesh color, like the color of your skin. It's got a, it'll probably be seared on the outside, but it's got like a gray, light pinkish color to it. The albacore that we were carrying was like really, really pink. It's rose colored and it's like a beautiful product. So albacore is a good choice as well. Cody, you got anything else to add? Are you on? She wants to know, um, so it's okay. I've been, I've been holding up the fort. Um, she wants, she wants, she wants to know, you know, non-salmon, non-tuna alternatives in sushi right now. And I was telling her, you've got Japanese distributors that are doing their own thing. They've got their own farms worked out. And then there was stuff that we were doing comparing frozen albacore seared compared to our fresh albacore that we were doing. The difference is night and day. Ours is pink. Theirs is like gray flesh colored, really weird. That's why it's always seared. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, we were carrying, um, there was a really great octopus product that we were carrying that just became into fashion. That was, had these really sustainable traps. It was coming out of Australia. That was a really cool one. Um, What's what else can you add fish, fish wise? Trap for octopus. Because usually we see videos of how they catch octopus in the Mediterranean, which is with the clay pots and they go in and they take it out. What are the other methods for catching octopus? Yes. They said, they said in the trap, the young ones can't push the button and the old ones are too big to fit in. So the right size one can get in and pushes the lever and it captures them. And then divers go down and bring them up. It's a brand new thing that's just starting to happen. And it's really, really cool. We were all... Yeah, me too. I know. I know. We I... were also using um, a vermilion snapper. The wild vermilions were amazing that we were doing too. We were just... We were just approaching the sushi a little bit different, you know, away from Japanese distributors, which is really interesting because we had some of the biggest Japanese distributors in the world, companies wise, come in and be like, hey, here's our brochure. Like, who are you guys buying from? And we're like, uh, we're doing it ourselves. And they're like, OK, what are you paying for this? And we were giving the prices and they were like, what? 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 And they just, yeah, the reps were just. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah they would just grab their stuff and walk out like it's impossible i mean so it, it when you're going to sushi i would say go to some place that's reputable go to some place that actually has a, a really good price point that's not cheap because you're going to be eating frozen food and, and chemically pressed food and that's dyed and just don't do that don't do that sushi should not be cheap you need an expert that knows what they're doing they got to make sure they're not giving you sachi parasites make sure you're not eating these disgusting, like, you know, processed products that none of that is ever good. And that leads to fish trauma, which we're trying to not have. Well, and I think that's what I love. If they're going to go to a restaurant and they're going to pay, you know, a quality price for their product, I think they like to, I mean, I know I like to learn along the way. That's why I go out to eat is because I want to learn something new and I want to try something new. And when you can get the story behind why it's on the plate, um, it usually actually makes the meal a lot more delicious. It's the carbon footprint, and the carbon footprint's also less too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. here's a really interesting story. When I was doing North American Seafood Expo in Boston last year, I met a lady who's developing QR codes for wild fish, especially tuna. She was telling me a story about a tuna that was caught off of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Huge tuna. I think it was like 700 pounds. Going to hit the market, going to be huge. Sold to a company in New York, traveled to New York, rebought, sold, traveled to Las Vegas. From there, it went to LA. From LA, it went to Japan, sold again, and ended up back over in New York at a restaurant a month later. So here's a fish that's traveling all over. It's been dead for 30 days, traveling all over the world, okay? Like doing its thing, and then ends up, you know, 
20, 30 miles from when it was originally caught. Like, stupid, 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 stupid. How much fuel it took to take a 700 pound fish on a voyage sightseeing trip all over the world. That's not sustainable. That will never work in any way, shape or form. And like that kind of stuff has to stop. So what yep. we're trying to do is close that loop just a little bit and start introducing that. What you're talking about too, Whitney, I mean, that's almost not even in fashion yet for the majority of the population. I, what would you just say? 10, 15% of people actually want to know where their food's coming from or how it was raised. I'm sure people care deep down inside, but the- Oh, I hope I don't get a QR code menu at your restaurant. <laughs> the, the best thing too is like trying to get away from the word sustainability and start using the word transparency. Because if you're Ooh. transparent about what you're doing, you have nothing to hide. And that's one of the great mysteries of sushi is it's always been a mystery. You can't really ask too many questions. The guy may not like speak English. He's going to look at you funny if you ask too many questions and just like shut up and eat this kind of stuff. Like for us, it was the opposite. I want to tell you every single thing we are doing because I want to empower you with information. Empowering the customer with information provides transparency and voting with your dollars matters. And by us being so upfront and open about it, created a really beautiful culture in the restaurant and people absolutely loved it. And that's what we will always be doing is being transparent and traceable about what we're trying to do and achieve. And that's the future of food. Even if it's fish or beef or vegetables or whatever it's going to be, that's the most important thing going forward when we feed ourselves. And as chefs, we don't want to be misrepresenting ourselves or, you know, to be blunt, just to be full of shit. I hate that. Like, let's be honest about what's going on. Well, and I would think that people working in the restaurant would want to be able to eat the food that they're preparing. And if they aren't preparing honest food that they're comfortable consuming, you know, and then serving it to others, it just doesn't make sense. Whitney, that, Whitney, that has been my like mantra from day one. I don't even like call myself a chef, but that is my mantra. Like you need to be stoked about eating this. This needs to represent yourself. Like if you think this is delicious and it looks amazing, I'm sure the customer on the other side is going to feel the same way about it. You know what I mean? That is it. Is this tasty? Is this beautiful? then be confident in it. it. Food should be simple enough. Unless you want to be doing like super high-end Michelin stuff where it becomes scientific. Yeah. But like in the essence, food is just food. That's what makes it so interesting yeah. is it can just be simply put out there. There's nothing better than going to Mexico and having a fish just grilled with some oil, salt, and pepper, and you eat it and you're like, God, why is this so good? It's because it's just yeah, fresh every and simple. Time. Like right? that's all it can be. You know, people are always asking for all these great, cook fish recipes. And I'm like, <laughs> do it like they do in Mexico. <laughs> do it like they do in Mexico. Get really good product, keep it simple, and you're going to win every time. Are there any tools that the home cook should have to make fish at home? So is there something that they should be using on the grill or, you know, a special tweezer to pull out some fish bones that they need to? Is there anything like that that you guys have in your own kitchens at home that you recommend? I mean, just to, to start off, if you want like the game changing pair of tweezers, there's a spring loaded uh, handheld tweezers. I, I'll show them to you right now. They're not even that expensive. They're only like 50 bucks. Those things save your hand and you can get so delicate in pulling out pin bones. It's crazy. I'll go get them right now and show you. That's one, one tip. Whoa, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I see them. Now I know, perfect. Am Amazon, no, no joke. These are spring loaded tweezers like and Cody's okay. saying yeah and you know traditionally too like to butcher fish you don't need a bunch of really expensive knives i mean we've worked with some mexican guys that were able to just do the most incredible things with you know ordinary knives a good fillet knife is important a good chef's knife can do all of that stuff you want to get really technical a deba is an amazing purchase you know and you can always go wrong but they can be kind of expensive. Um, I like a good scimitar knife. I learned a lot about cutting fish from um, Mexican fish butchers. And um, they use a scimitar knife. You want it to be really sharp, you know. A good honer is good. And um, a good uh, cut-resistant glove to protect your, your free hand. I, Cody, I was, I was telling her the story when I stabbed myself with a snapper spine and almost lost my finger. And I... I and I, 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 I cut myself more than I care to admit to, um, especially when we're breaking down fish and scaling fish. Um, good sharp knife. Yeah. 
and, and you know, a, a fish scaler, if you're using a whole fish yeah. and stuff like that's really important. Those are really cheap things to, to get. Um, and I, I'm going to give it out. I and mean, I can't believe I'm giving away the secret on a podcast, but um, Viva paper towels. That's my fuck. That's, that's my fucking secret. Listen, the more Viva gets sold, the more chances. Okay, Viva paper towels are like my trade secret. It's a, it's a non-print paper towel. Um, yeah. They're really absorbent. And um, they have super soft ones. Yeah, they're, oh like, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, yeah. literally, so this is the prep kitchen right now. <laughs> I think that paper towel that one of my clients has and it feels like a luxury towel every time I use it. But uh, the, yeah, and the, the reason um, we started using it too, because there's a thing called tuna paper that's high hyper hyperabsorbent, absorbs uh, fish. It's really expensive though. And um, I just like, dude, we go through these things so much. Like I can't be spending money on this stuff. So like one day, you know, we found the Viva and I'm like, oh my God, this stuff is in COVID. The only thing I did hoard was Viva, and that was a challenge. I was getting in fist fights over Viva. I was scouring the town, like, come home with my Viva. Oh my god, yeah, but yeah, me, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's Viva. So th those things, like I said, sharp knife, a scaler, uh, bone tweezers, and a great mm -hmm. non-print paper towel. The reason you want like the Viva, there's no print on them. Uh, with a printed paper towel, it'll leave those indentations on top of your protein. Oh, wow. So all I've seen chemicals that. and there's no color in them. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. No, no, no. Listen, this is, listen. No, no, because listen, this is what you got to do when you're doing public podcast kind of things and we're reaching this level. It's like making a cookbook and you're giving away your secrets. It's like anybody can buy Viva, man. And like, it's my favorite uh drying power to use with fish powder. Well, so how many there you go. Recipe that you got from a chef at a restaurant who said this is the recipe that we use at the restaurant and you make it at home and it doesn't taste anything like the version at the restaurant because they That's left true. they left an ingredient out. So yeah, <laughs> you exactly I appreciate you guys sharing the things that really work. And I feel like yeah. The tools that you guys have, your ability to know how to buy fish, to break fish down from scratch, like those are basic life skills. You know, being able to cook for yourself is a basic life skill that will carry you anywhere and, and anywhere you want. Um, if someone wants to learn how to work with fish well and be really comfortable with getting a whole fish and breaking it down, where do you guys recommend people go and learn? Who can I they learn from? I know, that's ridiculous. YouTube. <laughs> And also in and Instagram too. There, I, I follow some really good fish butchers on Instagram too. And like, you can pick up a lot of really good tricks. One of my favorite hobbies to do, like, is to go onto YouTube and deep dive on Japanese sushi chefs and stuff. There's all these Japanese bloggers out there. They're going to all these incredible high-end meals that I will never have time to go eat. And we're watching these guys, their process and cutting the fish. And then, and Cody and I are like, whoa, that was cool. Like, look what he did with that. Like damn, we've not done that. He must have learned that from his master. And that's some weird trade secret that, yeah, the, there's, the, yeah. Oh, dude, and that's the biggest thing was we're always learning. My God, be humble all the time. There's a lot of bad things you can learn on YouTube too about butchering fish, but you can kind of pick and choose. Just to back up what Cody's saying is different styles to it. There's like a dozen different ways to cut a whole tuna. And like, the way Mexican guys would do it compared to the Japanese guys would do it. Mexican guys would do it just a fillet knife, one guy, heck off the quarter sides. The Japanese guys will have three people with long swords pretty much and they'll be hacking off the sides like this. And then in Taiwan, they have like a really round half moon knife that we watch. These guys will cut these 700 pound fish on the floor with this half moon knife and they're doing cuts when they're going into stuff and we're like, whoa. And they're breaking off and it's perfect. And you go, whoa. There's a bunch of different ways. YouTube is, a, is, is probably one of the best sources for information out there that you can constantly look at. Our Instagram too has a lot of really cool stuff where we were filming myself or Cody breaking down fish and stuff like that. We should probably do a lot more of instructional videos like that on how to break down fish, but I don't feel like me and him are that social media like 
all the time. We need to be, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult. You have to have a film crew. If you're, if you're really a chef, you have to have a film crew doing it yeah. for you. If you yeah. guys are focused on the food. My, your hands are covered in blood and scales. The last thing I'm going to do, like. You're not an octopus. There isn't right. an extra hand. <laughs> <laughs> don't have Very limitations always be a, is, always always be a student is there anyone you recommend if people are jumping on youtube or instagram right now to look at i kind of recall some of their names there's yeah. one of my favorite guys i can never pronounce his name because he's a brazilian guy that works for i think it's wolf's cody his name is like yeah on the east coast i think i think it's wolf's he works for uh, his name is like Pavaria Baccarat. The butcher of his name, but he doesn't even he doesn't even post stuff anymore. But like when he first started doing it, I have never seen somebody cut tuna and fit, like fishmonger butchering though is completely different than what Cody and I do. Like sushi wise, like we're really delicate. We're we're a little bit slower. These guys do a forehand cut with the. I mean, like. It's not for your normal consumer. The stuff this guy was an artist. I like I said, he doesn't Amazing. So where can people go to follow you guys and where can they go to your restaurants? How they can, how can they eat your food? What other events do you guys have going on? Call out. Yes, absolutely. It can only get better from there. <laughs> but it's somewhere outside. I have to ask you just real quick. I know we need to wrap up, but I'd love to know what's the most absurd party that you guys had to cater sushi for? Like how much sushi was it? What else was going on food-wise at the party? Like 
How obscene was it? I'd love to know. <laughs> yeah. Start writing down the sushi diaries. So that can be the next there. Yes. Well, can you leave our listener with maybe one healthy tip that they can consider adding into their life?
It's just so rewarding when you watch someone eat a meal and feel good afterwards. You just want it for another person, another person, another person. Well, ending this with energy is, is the perfect way to wrap it up. So thank you guys so much for sharing your knowledge. And uh, this is fantastic. And I'll see you guys in a few weeks. I can't wait to support you.